Welcome to Fintech Impact. This podcast is an exploration of the financial technology world, interviewing different fintech entrepreneurs about what they do, their story, and what their impact is on consumers, incumbents, and the industry as a whole. Here's your host, award-winning financial planner, university lecturer, and writer, Jason Pereira. Hello and welcome to Fintech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today on the show, I have Daniel Everhard, CEO of Coho. Coho is a neobank, that is to say a company that sits over top of traditional banking infrastructure and provides enhanced experiences to consumers. And with that, here's my interview with Daniel. Hello, Daniel. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming in. So Daniel Eberhardt of Coho, tell us about Coho. Uh, so Coho is what's called a neobank or a challenger bank. Um, what that means is we sit on top of the banking infrastructure, the money sits with a traditional bank, and then we have built everything else. So with Coho, you get a no fee account, you get an account which automates a bunch of your savings, uh, an account which does a lot of the things that you traditionally associate with a bank account, and a lot of things that a bank account wouldn't do. Okay, well, we're going to jump into what those do's and don'ts are. And uh, before we get, so basically, and I've talked about this topic before, it was the Copernic, uh, what's been described as the Copernican Revolution in banking, the thinking behind that. And you're smiling. So have you read that paper? I have not, no. Okay, well, it applies directly to you before we jump into anything else. So it's a paper, I think, or a presentation that came out less than a year ago. And it talked about how the future of banking is really to provide infrastructure, kind of like an AWS, and let companies such as yourself build off extensions. And essentially, that way, you you guys are much more client-focused, client-centric because you're not worried about the back end, right, as much as the banks who can't play that game to the same degree. So you get a much better client-facing experience, but with the same security of the back end. Yeah, I mean, I think it makes perfect sense, right? Like we are, you know, the way that we talk about this that breeds specialization is how do we listen really, really well to our customers? And then how do we move really, really fast? Because we think those are kind of the first prob- the, the, the first principles of yep ultimately finding and creating value for our users, right? Well, and it was Bezos who said the only advantage you have in this world is speed. Yeah, so, that's uh, right. So perfect. So tell me what, uh, what brought you to found Coho in the first place. I mean, I was always pretty, so I think intrinsically I just grasped numbers. That was kind of how I understood the world. Um, and so from a fairly early age, I was reasonably sophisticated financially. And then uh, it really sort of the first sort of step, I would say, was when I went and lived in Europe for a while and came back and just found the banking system for the first time. Once you leave the Canadian banking system, then you come back, you realize how much of this is archaic. The and same thing applies to financial planning. Like, like it's amazing how it. many financial services you come back to Canada, you're like, I'm still putting up with this. Yeah, yeah. right? And, it's, and, and you just have no context until you leave the country. And then kind of the, the second thing was the, a lot of the Canadian banking infrastructure didn't make sense to me. Canadians, I think, think that we have a stable banking infrastructure, and that's true. But it, it feels like expectations that are far too low. Like, I think, you know, if you, RBC just announced uh, their highest or their most profitable quarter ever on the back of like 2.77%, what's called NIM. So how much money do they make off the deposits they take? And if you have less than $5,000 and you open a day-to-day savings account with RBC, they pay you 0.05%. Yeah, nice. So it's like a fraction of the people with the... I, I, I have said it before. It drives me insane. I feel like a country so, like we sold our souls to these banks for security. And in exchange, they are some of the most profitable banks per capita in the world. And we do not realize the degree to which we're getting fleeced. Yeah, absolutely. And it plays out not just there, but it plays out in the products we're sold, the way products are communicated. You take high MER mutual funds and they are super corrosive to people's retirements. Like it's this very kind of boring and deliberately boring problem, which is enormously lucrative for the banks and enormously problematic for Canadians. And, and it goes beyond that. Like even when they try to innovate and do things like robo advisors, and I'm not going to state who was involved in this conversation, but they they look at these things and say, okay, this is great. We can have money go over to these robo advisors when it gets to certain thresholds. And then they like, oh, they're like, wait a sec. But if we do that, then it eats into our lending margins and our spreads. So we can't disrupt the large cash deposits we're paying 0.25% on because now we're now we're basically addicted to that profit. Sure. And it's it's you know they they're they're dis- in a lot of ways they're disincentivized from doing the right thing because they're just used to that line that line out of revenue. So I want to I want to get back to that because I think that's a super important part of this conversation. Um, early when I was looking at this business, I had asked 10 of my friends for the last three months of bank statements and my brother had given me his and he had paid $85 in bank fees in three months. And he's like, 
uh, just a blue collar, great regular guy. And yeah. he had no idea that he'd paid it. And, and so that was like the way it really kind of became personal for me. And so that was, you know, coming up on, on four years ago now. Um, and so it's been the, the ensuing sort of four years have been getting this thing built and getting it stood up in a, in a market that kind of only expects five banks and, and kind of treats them as a commodity. And, uh, so it's, it's been a lot of fun. I always, I'm amused when people say, I love this bank or hate that bank. It's just like, you're debating flavors of vanilla. Yeah. Like it really is. And anyway, we can go on. I mean, there's all kinds of cases similar to that where, um, there's a well-known study that basically shows that, um, that basically no fee accounts in the U S are really predatory lending products because they typically target people with lower incomes who have a harder time basically keeping a balance. And then when they go into, when they go into a deficit position, the penalties they pay are so substantial that it actually isn't being more profitable than them paying, say, $5 a month for an account. It's one of the most lucrative products. It's, oh, it's so an backwards. It's an overdraft. And so so you, saw, you saw the evil. You wanted to create the light, uh, so, <laughs> for lack of it's a, a term. a dramatic way to put it. I'll yeah, take it. Well, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, you know, I pull no punches on this one. So, so, so basically, what was it that you wanted to create that would basically solve this problem? Yeah, look, I, I mean, I think, I think Canadians need, need two things. And the first thing they need is a great financial foundation. And that's your day-to-day product. What are you doing on a day-to-day basis? Do you have insights? How? What are the incentive structures associated with that account? And so that that's kind of what Coho is. And then I think the second tail uh, and, and the longer-term value is how do you act on customers' half on, be, on customers we have to bring them the best financial products? Like how how can you operate a mind share where they just know and trust that we are operating on their behalf and we want to bring them financial products, but they are products that make sense. And this ties into your earlier point, but the banks um, may or may not catch up in a, U, they'll catch up in a UX capacity, um, maybe catch up in a technical capacity. Mm-hmm. There is so much cultural inertia in the banking infrastructure around how to, like the entire experience is optimized around getting as much money from consumers as possible. Absolutely. And that, that ship is the hardest part of a bank to turn. I would debate that, the, that actually catching up on the other capacities is also going to be incredibly hard for them yeah, because I think. you're never going to attract the best co- the, the best programmers in the long run. I mean, you see it happen all the time. A, a company gets bought out and, you know, they rest until they vest and then they're gone, mm-hmm. right? And it's, it, it, you know, dealing with large institutions in the past in various capacities, the levels of bureaucracy you have to deal with when you're used to being a nimble startup and, you know, like it's two people to sign off on a project and you're off to the races versus, you know, eight people have to hum and haw and then basically get back to you have to deal with 12 other things. Like it's, you can't compete, you can't compete the experience. Yeah. I mean, I think BMO has 4,000 people and don't quote me on this because it's, it's all anecdotal, but I think they have yeah. like, uh, anyway, a few thousand people in their compliance department alone. Right. Whose yeah, only like, job is to slam the foot on the brake. <laughs> yeah, That's exactly. It. Yeah. But I, don't get me wrong. I have plenty of friends in compliance, yeah. but uh, sometimes it's look, frustrating. Look, it needs to happen. That's oh, not, absolutely. Yeah. So, so basically, you were looking to provide insight. So tell me about what it is Coho does from an end user experience. I decided I'm going to sign up on this website because I've seen some of your kick-ass marketing, which, by the way, bold bold advertising, which I, I love. You know, i got to say one of the better campaigns. I hope you guys win some awards for that one. But anyway, so I decide that I want something better. I go to your website. What happens? So you'll download the Coho app. Uh, and it'll take about three or four minutes to get an account, and then you're kind of off into the races. So as soon as you uh, have an account and we've identified you and and done all that good stuff, you will get a virtual card and you are ready to use the account. In the ensuing kind of five to six days, you should get your Coho card via the the mail, uh, pending no more Canada post strikes, (laughs) and uh, and you're good to go. And so with that, you know, I think of this thing as you can use it in the way that you would a traditional account. So the majority of our funds or a lot of our funds are just paycheck direct, meaning that's where people's paycheck lands. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some people keep their other bank account and move money in and use it as sort of in a spending capacity. So there's a bunch of different use cases, but the reason that people use it we do a bunch of things differently. We give you immediate real-time notifications in Canadian dollars. So when you're traveling and you're in Brazil and you spend reals, you get that notification in CAD. Um, so you the little pop-up screen at the top of your phone, you know, this just got purchased at whatever company. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. You spent $71 Canadian. We let you lock and block your card if your card's ever been compromised, which means more peace of mind. 
uh, as I mentioned, we have a virtual card. So sometimes you just don't want to go get your wallet and, or uh, you want, if you ever lose your card, you don't want to go through that headache of switching all your, your uh, bills and everything to your new card. So you just have your virtual card for that. So and let's then, talk about this. The virtual card is a card that exists solely digitally and you use it in a different capacity than a physical card. That's what you're saying. So end of the day, I basically use that information for deposits, payments, everything else, but I'm not actually, I'm not actually taking that out to make a purchase. No, that's right. So you still have your physical card to make a purchase. Apple Pay uh, is coming. Samsung Pay Thank is you. coming. Yeah, <laughs> Apple Pay is coming very soon. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And then look, the, but the whole idea that, that underpins the rest of the experience is how do we give people rich insights and so they understand their lives. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we have a bunch of uh, savings tools. One's called Roundups, one's called Power Ups, one's called Goals. And so Roundups just takes your spare change and rounds it up to the nearest dollar and sets that aside for you. Yeah, the old, um, yeah, I've seen that tactic done as a behavioral finance uh, cue exactly. for many, many occasions. And that can be, it's proven to be very valuable because people just don't notice those small incremental amounts. And it adds up materially. Power Ups is what we do. So for everything, if you think about the Canadian market, the, the debit market is actually bigger than the credit market. And so Power Ups is, if you think about this account sort of operating, looking and feeling like a debit account, with the exception that it's on Visa and can be accepted everywhere, we give everybody half a percent cash back on everything they spend in real time. So no games, no tricks. Once that transaction settles, that money's yours and you can take it out whenever you so want. So that's great because off the bat, they're better off for using debit than they ever were before. And it also, I mean, in a way, because I mean, you're looking, what you really officially are is a, is a prepaid Visa card, right? So basically there's no, people always love to get their points, right? And, uh, you know, failing to realize that sometimes they're paying the the uh, the annual fee that pays for those points in the first place, you're incentivizing them to spend in the exact same manner, but now they're better off by, by half a percent. That's right. Yep. And you take that whenever you want. And then the third element is goals, uh, which just allows you to set, we all have those savings goals, set that money aside, uh, set the time you need and the amount of funds you need. And we just take that money aside and put it to you, uh, put it aside for you every day. Um, this all rolls up into something called the spendable balance. And so with Coho, you know what, how much money you have to spend. And in a traditional bank account, you know how much money you have. Now that's often not a very useful number. For example, if you have $800 in your bank account, and $1,500 in rent coming out tomorrow, that's not reflected anywhere in your bank account. And it's very often not reflected because then you get NSF and that's profitable for the banks. So this allows you to action how much money you actually have once you have that spendable balance. Interesting. So essentially what you're doing is you're doing what any decent business would do is plotting out their future cash flow. But that sort of conduct and behavior is not something that's normal for the average day-to-day, well, for, for the consumer spender. That's right. So and so that's all programmable or do you actually scrape any of that data? So that's all within the Coho app and programmable. Now, the net effect of all of these things, and this is where it comes back to the financial foundation, is that the savings rate for, for most Canadians is the vast majority of Canadians is under 2% a year for millennials. It's sub 1%. 17% of the money that ends up on Coho ends up in a savings vehicle. So Excellent. then- at, 17%. 17%. That is astonishing. And that's, yeah. so is there the one killer feature that you're kind of accommodating? Like, have you able to say like, this is how much Roundup, Roundups is, is accomplishing. This is what we can attribute to goals. Have you studied that yet? Yeah. So the biggest, the biggest one is Roundups uh, because it's, it's just so frequent on every purchase, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, 25, you're, you know, it's 375, your 25 cents goes to savings. You don't even think twice about it. Exactly. Right. And then the other items are, I, you know, goals, we see quite a bit of variation because some people, goals is really interesting freeform text field. So some people use goals to save up for a dishwasher or to save up for rent and other people are saving up for a Lexus or a Tesla. You know what I mean? So the use cases are materially Mine's different. on order. Yeah, is it? Good <laughs> yeah. for you. Model three. I, I got off the train. Good for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it really depends on the use case, but we see roundups and certainly power ups is a really material percentage as well, just because, um, People use that so frequently and the and the action is so frequently. Like 90% of people uh, use roundups and everybody uses power-ups. Excellent. So interesting. So you basically have figured out a way to incentivize people to act in their best behalf and you've attached a savings account to it so they don't have to think twice about it, essentially. So that's where we go, right, is, is now that we've got this infrastructure, which is kind of 
a fly a flywheel and that it, it is generating your savings just in your day-to-day -day usage is now what is the optimal usage use case of that money and does it make sense to daily sweep it into a pisa account or into a low interest or excuse me a low mer investment account um, and so that's where we get into some of the other products that we talk about and bringing our users the best products okay so before we go down there let's let me help me understand how it is you guys exist because <laughs> you're not uh sure. you have to monetize what's the monetization strategy yeah so we make money uh three ways. The first one and the biggest one is the, so there's something in Canada called interchange. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the fee that the merchant accepts to, ex or pays to accept the card. So merchants aren't, this is not a new fee for them. Banks no, it's, have, it's already pre-existing. They're yeah, paying it already for every transaction. And, and banks don't really talk about the fact that they make one and a half percent of every transaction you make, sometimes two and a half, it used to be three. Oh. <laughs> so um, The so, more you peel back the onion. Yeah, <laughs> the, right? It's, yeah. it's material. And yeah. so because we have such a different cost infrastructure, we can make money off these accounts and have them be profitable off interchange alone. So we don't lose money on these accounts that are no fee without addressing new fees in the ecosystem just because uh, we have a totally different cost structure. So that's one. We make some money off the float. Uh, and then the third, uh, the float being the assets under management that we carry. Um, and then the third way that we make money is in bringing people other financial products. And so, you know, we we're very Referral open about that. Yeah, yeah, those kind of things. Yeah. So. I mean, I don't think anyone's going to be ridiculous enough to believe that you're going to do it out of sheer no, non-profit. I mean, like, but that being said, it doesn't have to increase your total cost. So, I mean, I know one of your strategic partners is well simple. Sure. Right. And I deal with them on an advisor capacity too. And I know that, you know, doing a referral arrangement, you basically get better pricing and there's a spread on that. Right. So let's talk about that. So what other products have you brought? And there was one you mentioned before we started that I got to yeah. say, I'm very amused by, but let's, let's go through who you've made deals with thus far. Yeah. So, you know, just, just to back up, we, sure, sure, yeah, 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 no, it's fine. Uh, so we like the, the reason that it's really important is that we break even on these accounts is so that we are never in a position where we have to sell people stuff they don't need in order to justify the existence of these accounts. Well, and that makes perfect sense. I mean, the incentives are everything, right? So the last thing you want to do is put yourself in a position where you're, you're trying to create an establishment of trust, showing yourself as different from everybody else. Right. And the second you compromise that you're sunk, your value exactly. proposition is gone. Yeah. And, and, and banks look at these accounts as loss leaders that they need to justify by selling you credit card debt at the end of the day. Yep. Um, we look at these things That's as profit so centers. Right. So anyway, yeah, we, we've got, it's interesting. We've got a number of things going on. So we're doing a, we have Wealth Simple in there, which is setting people up with a high interest savings account, borrow well for free credit scores, uh, Nesto for mortgage referrals. We've got Goose in there for travel insurance. Mm -hmm. So a bunch of products that we just believe in and we think are great products. Uh, and we're also experimenting with sort of direct to consumer products that we think are helpful. So, you know, we've got one in there with Endy, uh, which is the mattress company, the Canadian mattress company. Yeah, the Casper of Canada, um, which that, that amuses me that you have a, yeah, <laughs> have it's a, a mattress great mattress. mattress. I believe in it. It's I have mattress. an Endy pillow. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> yes. Um, and then, you know, but we're, yeah, it's interesting. Like, I'm not even sure if I'm supposed to announce this one yet, uh, but we're also doing one with Parachute Coffee, like a direct. Well, we're not airing company. for a couple of weeks. So, yeah, cool. <laughs> Parachute um, Coffee. Okay. Yeah, excellent. Like, Look, these are all experiments for us. And the way that we view these things is let's put the products in what we call the partner portal or the offer portal, mm -hmm. see if people engage, see if people have value, and then that will inform who we do ultimately deeper integrations with. So, uh, you know, the, the the success has been great. People have engaged. Uh, I think people do trust us and, and we're still, you know, learning how people think about our ability to bring them other products. And so this has been like a really low friction way to get stood up, see, learn more about the process, and then ultimately inform who we're going to technically invest in to make the product experience more cohesive. Excellent. Is the pricing uh, better going, like are you getting, are you getting a referral discount through you guys for, for some of these products? Yeah. yeah. We, we don't do it unless it's uh, a unique offer. Yeah. I mean, and you got to think about it. It's, it's a win-win situation, right? I mean, there's sure there's a referral fee in there for you somewhere that helps you keep this entire thing profitable. Yeah. But beyond that, I mean, it's still a better deal for the consumer. And when you look at like a lot of corporations, large ones have these entire like preferred vendor arrangements, whether it be with the gyms or the cell phone carriers, or whatever it is. How is this any different? Except quite frankly, this is smarter because it's putting it in the actual experience of where you're charting what you're spending. Right. 100%. You know, and, and maybe it does become Tesla becomes a preferred vendor and you can, you know, say, click here to set your goal for your Model 3. Click, you know. Exactly. <laughs> like, no, we absolutely. Cause, yeah. But if we know that and we know that it's in your best interest, then of course we'll bring you that product. Like I'll give you a classic example, which is we've looked at the utility bills that people pay based on their postal codes. And you would be shocked at the variation on people's on people's utility bills um, with different providers or, or uh, internet in Toronto, providers. I'm not, you know, I'm not shocked by anything when it comes to utility yeah. bills. <laughs> right? But there's these things that we take on face value to just say that, okay, well, it's normal to pay $100 a month in internet. But 
if somebody else is paying $40 a month for the same package in your building, yeah. um, then that's actually $720 a year. So that's an enormous value capture to deliver to the user. You, you just nailed the second least favorite industry for me, which is the telecom companies, sure. because like literally, I kid you not, and I, my business partner does this, he's got, he's got on his calendar every year when his, his contract is up for renewal, he calls them to hammer them down on price. And yeah. if he doesn't, that price is going up. And if he doesn't hammer them down, yeah. like it's, and if you don't, and they're just counting on low hanging fruit, people yeah. not to put up a fight. I don't put up the fight, so I like. like <laughs> yeah, I don't exactly. have the interest. I just I want the mental overhead of a company that operates in my best interest. This is unfortunately telecoms a different piece, but we'll yeah. get there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. One industry at a time. <laughs> One industry you can only change the world in bite sizes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, excellent. So um, I love the term neobank, and that's the first time I've heard that. Okay. Uh, so you sit over existing infrastructure. Who's your existing? Who's the bank on the back end? Yeah. So with the bank on the back end is called People's Trust, and so we we. By definition, and for good reason, we're not a bank. That that word is protected. Yeah. Uh, so the money sits with people's trust. We sit on top of that infrastructure. Uh, that's how it works. Excellent. So uh, you've had some comments about regulation as of recent. Uh, you want to talk about your feelings on that and the need for change? Yeah, look, I mean, I think it just, uh, I'm concerned as a Canadian and as a participant in the fintech ecosystem. Yeah. You know, I think that we... In the UK, maybe two and a half years ago, the regulators went ahead and said, we're going to do open banking. That's going to be a reality. Correct, yeah. You banks need to figure your stuff out so that this can this can happen. Yeah. And there was a bunch of moaning and groaning, and then they figured their stuff out, and now open banking is live, and, and UK customers are better served for it. And when you think about the opportunity set that creates for innovation, it is staggering. Like, you know, I've had this conversation before in this podcast about, like, you know, the store vendor could decide whether or not he's going to extend you credit or not based yeah. on the ability to access open banking data. Like, right. just the number of permutations, you can sit back and try to dream them up all day. Yeah. Yeah, and, and like the the one of the most common pushbacks is around security, but no, it's a nonsense argument at this it's, point. Yeah, it's because a they read only APIs, yeah. and b like I would much rather have a specialized firm who only thinks about monitoring my data, leveraging the open banking infrastructure, correct, to monitor my account behavior to see if there's any suspicious it's behavior. It's secure as the parties want to make it, right? And that's the issue. And I know that you know the thing with the banks in Canada, and you could get this. They have a very strong lobbying group. And they try to stop this stuff from happening, but we are we are falling behind in this country because of it. And and frankly, I mean, at this point, there's a massive war over data aggregation going on, and they are fighting it tooth and nail, basically saying, "Oh, our servers can't even handle this volume." It's like well, that's too bad. Like the consumer's got a legal right to that data. Yes. Yeah. the The ethical side of this equation is very very simple for me, which is that. Canadians are suffering because they don't have full information. And all of a sudden, once you start to realize what is happening within your bank account because other people are building fee monitors or things to protect your own, to own protect interest. your account, yeah, it becomes very, very clear. Yeah. No, it's 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 true, and it's uh, you know they've become very good. And this, the CBC did a wonderful expose on the, the sales practices and that they that go on at these places, and sure. how you know Wells Fargo got crucified, rightfully so, for all countless fraudulent accounts, uh, because again they're servicing their own best interest ahead of the consumer, and it's hard to change that. So you mentioned a lot of kind of interesting ways to uh, help consumers. Now I'm I'm wondering, like, are there any kind of features in the future you're looking at you can talk about now, or are those all kind of hush hush at this point? Look, I mean, whether or not open banking comes, we plan plan on providing people a, a holistic uh, sense of what their of what their financial life is. So, you know, we're going to get purview and insights into your your whole financial life and, and try and be helpful across that portion of it. Another thing that we're really excited about is uh, two things. I'd say one one is sentiment, and, mm-hmm. and so, you know, I still have a really arbitrary understanding of what my value that is created for my spend is. And Mm -hmm. so trying to map the value that purchases create in your life over the long term so that you can become a more informed purchaser, I think it's a really interesting decision. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I mean, here's the thing. I mean, you can get this some some of this intelligence or similar intelligence from like the Mint.coms of the world, right? And uh, I've, but you know what? Having it built into the app where you're actually spending your time is valuable because by default you get it. And in my own financial planning day job, essentially, I always encourage every client to set up some sort of aggregator like a, like a Mint.com. And I say, look, this isn't about you budgeting. Like everybody hates budgeting, but when you actually just dig into the data. And see where your money is going, and you're like, I spent what at Starbucks last year? Like, it's not about it's not about is that a bad thing? It's about how valuable is that action to you? And if it's if you have a problem with that, then the action is is basically not matching up with the value to you. So, and what I've found, and whenever clients will come will come back and say, you know what? 
I stopped spending as much money and it was the easiest thing in the world because I had information. Right. Yeah. And that, and that's, it's not about being parental or prescriptive. It's just about making you informed. informed. And it's like, you can spend $200 on a dinner and maybe that's a wonderful dinner. And maybe th- three months later, you think that's a great way to spend money or you can spend 200 bucks at the bar and hate it the next day. So how do you start to map the association between what spend is a high value and what spend is low value in your life so that you can make more informed decisions? And you can think about all the, all the refund, me- oh, sorry, all the uh, reinforcement mechanisms you can program into this. I mean, you guys are ripe for gamification of this sort of sure. thing, right? It's like, if, if you know, think about the number of people who are motivated by closing rings on an Apple watch, right? right like, right. You, you have that yeah. same kind of principle in like, you know, you close your daily savings ring or whatever it yeah. is and, and the kind of nudges that that, that gives that, that can give people. Huh. I mean, I, 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 I'm kind of, I'm always envious of certain companies when they come in and, and, and talk, thinking about their futures and the kind of fun, really cool things you guys get to attempt. And, you know, I look at your situation is the same thing. It's like you have all this data that you can basically help people just push them in the right direction for mm-hmm. their long-term benefit. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the things I, you know, I'm going to encourage you on the air to, to look at if you haven't looked at already is save more tomorrow. You familiar okay. with that? No, I'm not. So Save More Tomorrow was pioneered by by, um, by Richard Thaler. Uh, so now having won the Nobel Prize last year. Basically, what it is, is if you ask people, like, do you want to save more? The answer is yes. And they're like, can you save more today? The answer is typically no, right? right? But if you ask them, will you, you know, would you be willing to save more tomorrow? And what we mean by that is you, you're going to get pay increases roughly every year, at least inflation, if not more. You know, why don't we take a percentage of that and sell and put that into a retirement savings account. Mm. Right. And over time, right. If you can imagine that every year, say they get a two or 3% increase and they, they park one to 2% of that in a savings vehicle, as opposed to, as opposed to basically just consuming it, they don't notice it. Right. They, they really don't pay attention. You know, after, after 10 years, sure. The inflation is going to be noticeable, but the, the mass mass uh, pro- proliferation of, of savings rates in 401k programs because of this in the U S has been enormous. And I've been waiting for someone to do it in Canada. No one's done it yet, but I think you, you might, be able to crack that nut if you try. I, I would love to. You know, one, one of the things we talk about personally a lot that as it pertains to that is is just this notion of lifestyle inflation, right? Mm. When, when you're oh my eight, God, in yeah, your early right. 50s or, or you're in your, sorry, you're, you know, 25, 26 and you're living and you're making your forty, fifty thousand $50,000 a year, whatever that happens to be. And that seems like tons of money. Yeah. And then you get into your 30s and that salary goes up and and, and somehow you don't feel like you're getting ahead and you just watch your kind of life consume more and more of your income. Yeah. So like keeping think, up with the Joneses is a real problem. Yeah. So, so, so exactly. It's exactly right. So how do you bring awareness to those things? And again, not being parental or prescriptive, but just helping people be informed. Yep. Agreed. And I see this and, and coach people on it all the time. As I see their salaries increase, like they get promoted to massive positions, get these massive raises. It's like, look, this is great, but you gotta understand if you, if you basically start consuming this, you're stuck there. Yeah. Like, you know, I've plenty of clients who are like, okay, well, you know, you're not happy at your job, but you know, you have three kids in private school, sure. you know, you have the cottage now that's massive that you're also paying that mortgage down on. You frankly, if you were to leave that job, you probably got to take a haircut of X percent. You can't afford that. Mm-hmm. So you have to make a decision, your unhappy job or the lifestyle you become accustomed to. Right. It's, it's not a pretty position to be in. And most people stay in their unhappy job. And that's really, unfortunately really sad. Is. It is, it is. And it's, it's, you know, if you think it's not going to affect the happy lifestyle, you're dead wrong. Yeah. Right. Because those changes they originally absorbed were incremental in terms of the value they created in their life. That's it. That's it. And, and, and sooner or later, and I've seen it all happen all the time, because the problem is when that trend reverses and suddenly the income starts to come down, they're like, I've literally crossed that across people like, we can't find room to spend. And it's just like... Let's be a little realistic about what the average Canadian lives off of and what you're living off of. It's a big difference. It's not. Uh, it's just. It's not that you're not. You don't. You can't find room. It's just you're not willing to, and that's fine. But you got to live with reality. So yeah, I, I coach people on that all the time. It's very. It's very troubling. And this is. You know, it's one of the reasons. You know, there's various. I'm not going to pick on specific professions, uh, but there are well known professions that involve medicine where this is. This is infamous. Where this is infamous. And I'll tell you, the most common thing I hear from clients in those professions when when we tell them like, look, you can't afford to do X, Y, and Z. And it's like, well, my buddy's doing this. Yeah, but I don't know that your buddy's not going broke. Yeah. Right. Like it's the common issue. Yeah. Uh, so anything that helps correct that is uh, is great. Now, you guys aren't the newest of fintechs. You've been around for several years now, haven't you? Yeah. I mean, so we launched uh, spring of last year, you know, in the Canadian, uh, we had to get 
sort of five or six key partnerships to get this thing stood up. So yeah. we were around two years before that. I was uh, going to say, you were definitely around before that because yeah, yeah. I've seen the name for a long time. For sure. We've been raising capital and building and uh, and trying to get this thing to market. And mm-hmm. and yeah, so we've been live for a year and a half now, I guess. Excellent. So I, I feel like I've been hearing your name for so much longer. But yeah. you know, <laughs> in fintech parlance, three years is a long time. Yeah. Um, so a couple of questions to round this out before we actually... Um, before we actually uh, wrap this up. So in building this company, what have been the biggest challenges you've faced? You know, I think get to the point of building, um, there's just no infrastructure to do this in Canada. Like if you if you are in the United States, there are or UK or a number of like, there's lock stock and you can get these things stood up in six weeks. Six um, weeks, wow. Um, to, to get these programs live and, and in a functional way. And we've just had to build uh, a lot of the thing items from scratch, which is now great because it, it makes it a lot harder for people to follow in our footsteps. Well, you have a moat now, yeah. right? You have a trench. That's right. But yeah, I mean, look, getting six, seven key relationships with banks and Visa and, you know, we've, we've worked with three banks to get this thing up. We have a processor partner. There's just, so that was, that was hard. Um, and frankly, you know, learning a lot on the job is trying to, uh, trying to understand and consume all that while you build a team and a company that, that was certainly one of the hardest parts. And, you know, now Coho is, is 55 people and, uh, growing, growing really quickly. We, you know, kind of 10 X this year in terms of our growth. Yeah, and so now Co is, is growing very quickly. We're 55 people. We're we're 10x. We're kind of hiring uh, rapidly, and so now you know it, it's becoming a much larger institution, and it's becoming sort of a a, a mid sized company. And so um, that comes with when you have that kind of fast growth, it's really fun and, and really challenging to to make sure that you stay true to your values. And, and yeah, you, know, you got to be very careful of your of your corporate values because I mean, if you don't. Your, your corporate culture is what's going to determine how you deal with those difficult parts going forward because you can't you can't touch everything anymore, right? No, yeah, and, and so for me personally, learning learning how the feedback loops are different in sort of this stage of the company versus other stages has been part of it for sure, and it's making like making sure that this is a company that we're all really proud to work at, that the, the team's really proud of, and that we feel like we're moving the needle for Canadians, which you know so far we have, and we're kind of feel like we're in the second inning, so it's really, really early in this game and mm-hmm. got a long ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> the sooner you can give me ban- corporate banking accounts, the happier I'll be. We're working on it. Yes, well, my bank knows what they did yeah. um, <laughs> or didn't do, whatever it might be. So if you had one wish as to something you could change in the in the system, uh, I mean, besides the banks actually having modern infrastructure, <laughs> uh, yeah. what would it be? I, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is I just will wish that uh, Canadians held their banks to a higher standard. Like I think that as opposed to high esteem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it's a point of pride in the economy and that's how we hear about it. And that's great. But how it manifests for a Canadian's life like it, how it manifests for Canadians is, is super problematic right now. And when the government when the Bank of Canada lowers interest rates and all five banks don't match on the same day. Like it's not <laughs> even close. No, no. <laughs> so, um, well, so, you know, I, I but wish we have the competition. Canadians, we have five competitors and no, I'll be like, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, so look, I, I, I'm not putting it out like, cause we need to take ownership and there, there is quite a bit of apathy in the Canadian banking space. I think for the thing that I, I would change, um, I, I just want more Canadians to be using this, like whether that's uh, with the Coho brand or through partnerships or whatever that happens to be. I think that we've helped people save money. We'll continue to help people save money. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's what we want to deliver on. Fantastic. No, I mean, I like to, I unfortunately like to refer to Canada's banking system and the consumers they serve as the worst case of Stockholm syndrome I've ever seen institutionally. <laughs> I mean, literally. That's a good, that's a good yeah, I mean, it's true. I mean, we get we get fleeced. I mean, you know, they have, we have the statistics to prove it. We get absolutely fleeced. And then the best part is, is they turn around and pay piddly dividends in return. And everybody loves to invest in bank stocks because of it. And it's like, let me get this straight. You know that this, this, this small sum that they just paid you on a quarterly basis, it's because they just fleeced you. Yeah. So it's like... Thanks for nothing, but there's bankers with bigger bonuses and bigger payrolls than we've raised in our entire capital. I, well, we can talk offline about some of the stories <laughs> I've heard. Yeah. Um, anyway, so what is the this is the kind of the wrap up question? What's the big thing, or what what is it that excites you and gets you up in the morning to keep on working on this? Like, what drives you in this entire business? I, I think two things. I think the first thing is just the the scope of this opportunity. Like, we really believe that we are in the right place at the right time, um, and that the work we do is really important and so that's that's super energizing and the second thing is the team like the the coho team is is really amazing and uh i get to learn from them every day and uh, build this company with them and you know it's i just feel very lucky to, to be able to do that 
Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your time. I mean, this has been great and I love everything you're doing. And I'm, like I said, sometimes I get really envious of the opportunities you guys are seeing. And I got to tell you, this is, this is one of them. You know, this is, I kind of look at you guys as a potential behavioral finance corporation, sure. you know, in the banking space, because this is, this is wonderful. But uh, once again, thank you for your time and I uh, hope everybody loves this. Take care. Thank you very much. Appreciate you having me. So that was uh, Daniel Everhart from Coho. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And I kid you not, I am definitely jealous of all the great data they're getting and the ability to play with behavioral finance and all kinds of nudging. So hopefully we start to see better end client experiences that create the be better end client outcomes in the future through some of these startups. And with that, as always, I'm Jason Pereira. This is Fintech Impact. And thank you yet again. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever it is you get your podcast. Take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at fintechimpact.co.